The chair recognizes the Honorable Jim Townsend. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, in addition to all the things that you learn about after serving here for six years, you become something of an expert on farewell addresses. There have been some really excellent speeches and some that are not so good. But I've noticed a few things along the way, and one of the things I've noticed is that uh, members of the minority will often point out the failings of the majority, and members of the majority have a tendency to, oh, let's say, take credit for some things that are either not very difficult to do or they really don't have a lot to do with. One example of that would be finishing budgets on time and lowering debt. I mean, how hard is it to do something that, well, lowering debt is all you ever talk about, and finishing things on time, I mean, how hard is that when you're in charge of the entire state government? And as far as um, things that you don't have a lot to do with, lowering unemployment, I just hate to share with you, is something that you really don't have a lot to do with. I mean, let's face it, we've had a 17 million auto industry in this state for years, any time. And I am, I am a veteran of the auto industry. I can tell you any time you have 17 million vehicles moving in this country, you're going to have low unemployment in our, in our wonderful state. So, uh, you know, it's just, it's just something I thought I would point out. Um, now, thinking about what I was going to say today, I, um, I found it difficult. I almost didn't give this speech because I wanted to finish on a positive note. And, um, and yet, other than the really, really you know, wonderful relationships I've, I've formed with quite a number of people here, I don't have a lot positive to say. And it makes me remind, it, it reminds me of um, something that Woody Allen once said when he was finishing up his stand-up act, and he wanted to finish on a positive note, and he couldn't think of anything positive to say. He asked his audience if it was okay if he, would, if he could offer them two negative messages. Um, you know, two negatives equal a positive. Does everybody get that? Okay. Um, and that's really what I have for you today. So I've got two negative messages that I'm going to offer because I really, really care about this institution, as I know all of you do. And all of us have a responsibility to try to leave this place and this state and liberal democracy in a better place than we found it. So if you'll bear with me, I'm going to cover a couple of things that I think are really important. Um, so negative message number one is that Flint will happen again. Something, somewhere, somehow, something will, will happen here, something we do here will trigger something terribly negative in the lives of someone in this state. Now hopefully it won't be as catastrophic as what took place in Flint, but people are going to suffer. That's going to happen unless we change. Because the Flint crisis is one thing, is something that we could, have, we could have prevented. And the one way we could have prevented that is if we had conducted oversight. Oversight is our fundamental responsibility here in this state. Uh, and we do not take that responsibility very seriously. Now, you may remember that gosh, almost six years ago now, we passed an emergency manager law. And if you think about what happened in Flint, if you think about what's happening in the Detroit public schools, it has a lot to do with that law. Now, whatever side you were on, whether you voted for it or not, there is no denying that in Flint, we cycled through five emergency managers in five years. And how many, did, how many hearings did we hold in this body to talk about that? No, none, not one. We did the same thing in DPS. We didn't hold a single hearing. We didn't hold a hearing when the water was turning brown in Flint. Now, I mention that because it's something we, could do, we can do something about that, and all of us here has the capacity to do that. All of us have served, I'm not all of us, but I'd say most of us have probably served on a board of directors, you know, whether it's for a nonprofit organization or a bank or a credit union or something like that, and I guarantee that if you were cycling through a new CEO every year, you would have held a meeting about it, right? Well, we are the board of directors for the state of Michigan. Local governments, school districts only exist because we authorize them. We make their rules. 
So in the future, when, they're, when we're cycling through leaders, when, we, when, when local governments can't balance their budgets, we should start holding hearings and start figuring out what's, what, we should start getting to the bottom of it, because that's what our job is. My second negative message is that I believe that liberal democracy is endangered in this state and in this country. We just elected a president who openly deceives the American people. He claims that he won the popular vote when he lost it by nearly three million votes. His campaign trafficked in fake news and initiated and ret or retweeted outrageous lies on a weekly basis. And what this election has shown us is that there are many, many people who don't know or don't care about the difference between fact and fiction. Donald Trump has refused to release his tax returns or properly divest himself of his investments because he says the law doesn't require it. While that is highly debatable, that's a highly debatable point, I would argue, the real point is that what the law says only has any meaning if we, in, if we insist that it applies to all of us. Donald Trump received endorsements from only two newspapers in the entire United States, and both of those papers were owned by people that contributed to his campaign. He has appointed a Secretary of State who has significant business interests and ties to an autocrat who runs Russia. Now, why should you care? Now, we all care because we're Americans, but I want to ask my friends on the, on the Republican side of the aisle, because I'm aware that quite a few of, of folks in the party are pretty enthusiastic about the prospect that this president will sign Paul Ryan's budget. Now, I cannot condemn political leaders from finding ways to work with the man who was elected president of the United States. But as you do, I want you to remember that fake news used by another name is propaganda. And people with names like Hitler and Stalin and Pinochet and Castro used fake news, flouted democratic norms, and ultimately oppressed and butchered their people. Fake news helped elect a Republican president, but in two years, it might be used to deny a Republican governor or some other uh, a Republican the governorship or some other office. Why do I bring this up in a farewell speech? Who wants to listen to this, right? That's what I was going to ask. <laughs> Thank you for joining my speech, Mr. Speaker. I really appreciate that. I bring this up because in a farewell speech, what are we doing? We are thanking the staff. We are honoring the clerks and the Legislative Service Bureau and the House Fiscal Agency. And when we do that, we are honoring the work that they do to uphold liberal democracy. Liberal democracy, the practices and norms and procedures that allow us to come here and disagree in good faith. That's why I mentioned it, Mr. Speaker. I'm raising this today with all of my colleagues because I know that all of you value the privilege that liberal democracy gives us in this chamber and you realize as much as I do that and this is a recent study I, I, I heard about that three-quarters of people believe fake news three-quarters so someday that fake news is going to be turned against one of you or the causes that you hold dear Now, what do we do about this? I'm not sure. I'm not sure what we can do. But I want to share with you a couple of ideas. And one of them comes from, or I think the best ideas I've heard lately about this come from a, a man named Yasha Monk. He's a, he's a lecturer at Harvard University, and he has three ideas, which I think are really worth, worth sharing. One of them is that we should monitor what's going on. If Donald Trump starts to abuse some agency of government, the FBI, the IRS, you know, fill in the blank. We should keep track of what he does. We should explain the principles of liberal democracy 
to people who don't think about this all the time. And we should help them understand what it means when, when and if, but when, Donald Trump violates those principles. And finally, we should build a coalition of with, with, our, with brothers and sisters on both sides of the aisle. Liberals, conservatives, Democrats, Republicans, libertarians, to do all these things. To monitor, to educate, and finally, to object. So I'm asking all of you here, are you willing to stand by while the president undermines the norms of liberal democracy? Think of it like this. We don't come together around, if we don't come together around and fight for liberal democracy, all the other fights that we care so much about, the fight over health care, the fight over education, the fight over my favorite one, taxes, we won't be able to have those fights. So I come here and ask all of you, as my legislative career comes to an end, to monitor, explain, join with others, and object. As we come together here, and as I end, I want to, you know, join all of you in thanking the guardians of our democracy. But I also want you all to remember that you're on that list too. While you're serving here, and as long as you spend on this planet, you're a guardian of democracy. And you have a responsibility to monitor, explain, join, and object. And with that, I want to thank my wonderful staff, Jennifer Smith, Amanda Husti, Alex Fike, Ryan Smith, Dan Opsimer and Joe Fassard for their fantastic work and for the work and the work of all the central staff. And I want to thank you for listening to me today. It means more to me than you know. Thank you.